So as I mentioned, um, we are going to be interactive throughout this there'll be times when you're muted times when you are asked to raise your hand which if you look in the reactions at the bottom of your screen you'll see how to raise your hand there um, there'll be times when um, i'll do the role play so there'll just be two of us unmuted so i'm still uh, looking for that volunteer in just a minute but let's go ahead and get started welcome to leading by design Leading by Design is a monthly meetup and it's designed to help leaders apply the innovative principles of design thinking to the everyday challenges they are facing. And today's topic is adapt adaptability. According to Harvard Business Review, adaptability is the new competitive advantage, but it's not only the competitive advantage for organizations, it's also the competitive advantage for us as leaders in the organization, as well as the competitive advantage for our employees. And as you'll see, as we go through the slides, whether you're an individual, a leader, or an organization, all share some basic human traits that connect us all together, connect them all together. And it's in today's session that we're gonna look at those common human traits, the threads that connect them, how that relates to adaptability. And lastly, we'll end up with a role play to show the effective use of design thinking to create a more adaptable team and organization. But as customary with design thinking, if you're new to it, we always start with a vision statement that we have formed, turned into the form of a question. And so uh, you'll hear the term often in design thinking, how might we statements. And a how might we statement is where we turned a vision statement into a question. And so next slide gives us our vision statement or question for today. And that is how might leaders become more adaptable as, individually, as individuals and collectively as organizations and their teams. Now, um, when it comes to design thinking, innovative leadership principles, what I've coined leading by design, there is a direct report and often important partners. Wait a second. Um, so rewind. <laughs> um, what we have here is the vision question. It is the vision that we want. Obviously we want more adaptable individuals and teams and organizations in the form of a question. And it's this question that we then take to our users. Now, in the traditional sense of design thinking, the users would have been the clients and you would have been, uh, the vision question would have had more to do with either a product innovation or a service innovation. But when you're talking about leading by design, which is about applying the design thinking principles as a leader to your team, then the user becomes your teammates, whether it be your direct reports or partners, both inside and outside the organization that help you accomplish your goal as a leader. So that's what this vision statement is used. It's our launching pad for doing the phases of design thinking, which are empathy, define the problem, ideate, prototyping and testing with our team. So that brings us to what is known as human-centered design. The reason why design thinking is considered human-centered design is that it begins and ends with the human in mind. However, there's a distinct difference when you're using design thinking as a leadership principle, i.e. leading by design. Your user isn't just someone you check in with at the beginning or you check in with at the end. Your user becomes someone you're working with on a daily basis, and they, they are a part of the entire process, not just checks and balances at the beginning and the end. So it's important that um, we dig a little deeper into what it means to be human, because it's a little bit more than just user interviews at the beginning and then prototyping and testing at the end with the users. And that brings us to our next slide. Can't, thank you, Candace. So now I don't know if I'll be able to see, but if you can ra raise your hands um, to show me if you heard this part of the presentation from me before, because I don't want to go into extensive detail if this is a, a repeat for the most of you. But from what I can see, 
I don't think it is. I don't recognize a lot of faces on here. Is there anyone that's seen this before? All right, I don't see any hands. So we're gonna dig into this. What it means to be human. Um, as you can see on the picture on the right, uh, on the left of the screen, there are four parts to being human. And I wanna start with the center, the golden egg in the center. Um, it's often labeled spirit or being. All right, I had to, needed to mute someone there. So it's often labeled spirit or being. It's that part that is unique to each of us, but that we all share. So I've, I've depicted it as the golden egg here because it's where the gold lies. This is those gifts and talents that, yes, we may have developed them over our lifetimes or in our jobs, but um, they were gifted to us. They were the gift and talents that we were born with, and we've developed them through either life experiences or our own efforts to grow. But that's where the gold lies. And from that gold, those gifts and talents comes our hopes and dreams. Um, but it's also an egg because it's very fragile. Uh, let's see. I see a text message. I'm sorry. I don't want to ignore anyone. Candace, will you watch the chat? Um, sure. Yes. Yeah. If there's anything I need to do, just interrupt me. All right. So back to this. So this golden egg also is fragile. That's why I've depicted it as an egg because our, because our gift and talents are there, there's, um, there are our hopes and dreams are there as well. And so this is something obviously that's very fragile to us, very important to us. And we may not even recognize what that is at a time, but um, it's what connects us as humans. It's our uniqueness, but it's also things that um, we each have individually. And it's in a team setting, it's the understanding of this unique gifts and talents that when we master bringing our teams together, allow us to work in creative environments like is required today. So the second part of being human is the mind. And obviously the mind is a very complex uh, piece of equipment, but I've kind of broken it just down into the simple uh, two parts right now, which is the left brain and the right brain. The left brain is very logical, very thinking brain, and the right brain is your creative brain. Much of the past decades in the information age was very much about left brain, logical thinking, linear processes. And uh, we had very little use, or most of our employees would have very little use of the creative mind. Uh, and then our body. Our body is obviously the container for those things, but it's also how we do our work. And it's also how we experience life through the five senses. Now, Science has uh, determined that we have an energy field, which is the fourth part of being human. And our energy field surrounds our bodies by about eight feet long, and we all have them. And so our energy is our emotions or our feelings. And what I mean by that is often ener this energy is, uh, um, our emotions are often called energy in motion. That's uh, a coin that a phrase that's been coined in psychology. So the, the thing that's important to recognize in these four parts is that when our being and our thinking and our doing are in alignment, our feeling or our energy is expansive, it's opened. And when, our, when something is out of alignment, being, thinking, and doing, then our energy is closed. And you may have recognized this if you walked into a room where two people were arguing and they became silent. You, you had no idea what was going on. Nothing had been said, but you felt the energy in the room. You felt the negative energy in the room. Um, same thing, if maybe you walked into a room and two people were celebrating something and you they didn't say what was going on, but you knew from walking in by the energy in the room that something positive had just happened. And you may even ask, well, what did I miss? Because you want to be in on that positive energy. So that energy opening and closing is very important uh, when it comes to adaptability. And if you look to the scale on the right, which is an emotional scale, 
you'll notice that there's all these negative emotions on the bottom and positive emotions on the top. And it is these emotions that either close our energy or open our energy. So if you, for instance, you see on the bottom, there's anger there, there's frustration there, even boredom would classify as a bottom. When people are uh, experiencing these negative emotions, then their energy for the most part is closed. And when you think of um, our energy being closed, think of it as being stuck, not willing to move forward, um, where the energy above the boredom line is positive, it's expansive, think of it as more adaptable energy, you're ready to move forward, you're excited to move forward. Um, things like hope, optimism, enthusiasm, and eagerness fall into this uh, scenario here. So as you look at these um, things, I have a question for you. So if you would unmute yourself, my question is, what percentage of the time do you feel employees spend in the emotional energies at the bottom? Frustration, impatience, anger, powerlessness, Anyone want to throw out a number? There's no statistics. I'm just asking from your experience, either as an employee with leaders above you or as a leader with employees below you, what is your experience? Do you find that there's a lot of time spent during the day in these emotions? Uh, not most of the time, but, uh, you know, like during short periods, especially when it comes about stress, you know, work stress. Mm -hmm. that in my private life I try to be on the let's say on the top yeah I, I put, I, I put uh, much I put it on that you know like uh, on that on my energy try yeah. to hold things that uh, take me down mm -hmm. so well I think trying it's, to I think it's interesting to Andrea that you say in your personal life you focus try to be more on top and that's a, that's a good point because in our business life, um, oftentimes we're, we're not in control of our circumstances. And so those circumstances can lead to these negative emotions of frustrations, powerlessness, yeah. anger, correct? Yeah. yeah. However, what I did try to do, I'm sorry, I have my kid, I'm here. No, that's <laughs> okay. Sorry. However, what I try to to think when someone at work uh, talks to me in, you know, like in a bad manner, okay, mm -hmm. I try to say, hey, this is not personal. Right. This is not personal to me. This person is frustrated because of this situation or the other. So that's the way I try to protect myself from going <laughs> downwards. Yeah, yeah. I and think that's, that's a very good point, a Andrea. Um, that energy field, those emotions really belong to us. And so even though we may, someone may do something that tries to disturb that energy, when we are aligned in our being, thinking, and doing, we really can be undisturbed. Usually we get disturbed from others or circumstances like work stress when something is off in this alignment of Think, being thinking doing and we're going to get into that um, very pretty quickly here so the key insights into why leading by design is crucial for today's business was someone going to add something okay um, the reason why it's crucial for today's business is going to be coming up in the next slide but it's empathy and defining problems in the terms of our employees' needs that are effective at releasing these negative energies. Until we empathize and we begin to define the problems in, in relation to being their needs, then they remain stuck in these negative energies and can't move into the positive energies. And obviously we want them in the positive energies because that's when we become more adaptable, which is what today's conversation is all about. In fact, Zig Ziglar said it best when he says, you will get all you want in life 
if you help enough other people get what they want. And so that's the beauty of design thinking. You see, as leaders, we have a need. We have a vision that we need to accomplish, right? And we traditionally, we've seen our employees as the means to create or accomplish that vision. And truly, they are. However, it's not a one-way relationship. It's a two-way. And so they cannot accomplish our vision for us because obviously we as leaders can't do it all ourselves if they have unmet needs. And so it is it, our role as a leader to figure out what those needs are and to help them create self-agency, which is uh, take care of the needs on their own, or if it's a system process or company issue, then to remove the needs for them because it is, the, it is their needs which become our problems or our blocks to achieving that vision. So like Zig Ziglar said, we get everything we want if we help enough other people achieve what they want. So they want their problems removed so they can get to the vision and we want the vision. So it works hand in hand. And then from the empathy and the, the define the problem stage, we move into co-creating with our employees in meeting those needs through the ideation, the prototyping, and the testing phases. So all, all that's working together to engage the employee's whole self, which you hear a lot about today. How do we bring our whole selves to work? Um, it is in this space of creativity that we are able to bring our whole selves to work. It is no longer about our bodies, which is, means our butts in the seat doing the work. It's not just about being locked in our logical brains, doing the next step or figuring out the, the linear process. It's also bringing in the creative right brain as well as the gifts and talents of the individual. So this alignment, which we'll see as we move to looking at the individual from an adaptable standpoint and the organization will be very key. So, but before we move into the role, um, Let's take a look at what adaptability looks like. Slide, next slide, Candace. Okay, so I, I kind of outlined the being, thinking, doing, feeling experience, what it is and what it is not. And this is where I want everyone to come unmuted and talk me through this, um, what it is and what it is not. And obviously in an organization, uh, there are complex needs or uh, complexity about what we need to be adaptable are. There's usually hundreds of things. So we'll take it, boil it down to something simple. You are driving in traffic to an appointment and you have um, hit a snag in traffic. There's been a wreck ahead and so you're stopped. And so what is adaptable, adaptability look like? when it comes to a simple issue like that, or maybe even a more complex, what, what are we being when we are being adaptable in a situation? Any thoughts on what we're being? There's a hint you're being, being is being being something like if you're going to your appointment as i mentioned in the car you may be trust trusting you're being trusting that everything's going to open up and you're going to get there on time or you may be trusting that um you know you can call the client and they will understand that you're running late because of trust of um traffic Trusting is one thing. What's another thing you're being when you're being adaptable? Okay. Could it be flexible that you're just being flexible to, um, to deal with whatever the situation may be at the particular time? Absolutely. Yes, flexible is one of them. Uh, what yeah. is the one, what, what, there's another word we hate to hear um, because we're usually not this, but there's another thing we need to do when we are required to be an adaptable. What would that be? 
Uh, resiliency in certain, in a certain way. R resilience. That's a good one. Be resilient. Be ready. Be ready to change uh, your course of action. You know, yes. like okay, I can do this. This what I cannot do it. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, Be, uh, that kind of goes along with what Candice was saying. Flexible. Some others that I yeah. came up with were us being patient, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be patient that this is going to, you know, work, work its way through, uh, accepting, you know, have you ever not accepted something difficult like that? You just get the frustration level goes higher and higher and higher when we're not being accepting of this is what is happening. We're kind of in a form of denial. And so that affects our energy. Um, willing, you know, we have to be willing to sit there not run our fellow travelers over to get around them. Um, and so, and we have to be open. We have to be open to, okay, things are not going as I plan they, them to go. So I have to be open to what is and open to the possibilities, which kind of brings us to our thinking. When you're adaptable, what, what kind of thinking is going on? Anyone? For me, it's being present and being calm. <laughs> okay, those are more being things. So <laughs> you want being yeah. present and being calm. Yeah. So thinking when you, positively. <laughs> yeah, thinking positively, right. You, you Thinking positively is a great one. You might, might also be, uh, start getting creative in your thinking. Okay, what other routes can I, you know, is there an exit I can get to, or, um, you know, using our imagination to, to get us out of the situation we're in and into the next, to, into a better situation. Open to exploring. Maybe we only know of one route to our appointment, but now we can be open to explore. Maybe there's another way to get there on time. Um, and also looking for patterns, you know, is it, is one lane moving over another, um, is, it looked like, you know, I can see five cars ahead and it's moving freely. So I don't, I don't have to uh, worry too long. I'm not going to be in this spot. So it's looking, it's adapting, it's imagining, it's thinking positively. And the doing phase, the doing part. So this can be, oh, I kind of just mumbled these two together, but uh, doing can be focused, focused on being present, focused on paying attention to what's going on in front of you, experimenting with other options to get there, exploring, maybe being productive. Maybe the traffic's going to be sitting there for another five or 10 minutes and you can be productive because you're not going anywhere. Um, and whatever the next right step is. So the folks, so when you have all those things, when you're being patient, when you're being flexible, when you're thinking positively, when you're doing what it is you can do for the circumstances, that is when we are most adaptable. And those things, as you can uh, read in the definition, adaptability is capable of being adapted, ad able to adjust oneself readily to different conditions. So that's when we're aligned, but sometimes we get misaligned and we forget all about the being part, the patient, the flexible, the calm. And we go right to the thinking and the doing. And how does that look in our traffic scenario? Anyone had a, had a traffic scenario where the being was missing? Right, and you're screaming and you're yelling and maybe you're butting in a different line and uh, causing a lot of feelings, not only for yourself, but for your other fellow past drivers on the highway. And so things are out of alignment and we're not being adaptable, correct? Well, what I try to do in those situations is say, okay, there's nothing I can do to avoid this traffic jam. So what can I do to, you know, to avoid my, or lessen my frustration? So yeah. let's put some nice music on the radio. Yeah. Or let's think about something because right. I want to, there's, there's nothing I can do. 
Right, exactly. Now we yeah. lose. Now I made it one of these simple um, scenarios of driving in traffic because now take that to the opposite end of the spectrum at work when you have demands and pressures and your boss and customers and emails and you have all these things that are trying to pull you from being the adaptable person you are capable of being to a person that is not adaptable. And so um, let's go to the next slide where we talk about the leader versus Candace, the next slide versus the organization. Because really, uh, Organizations are a sum of their leaders. The organization, its systems, processes, products all reflect the leaders and their intentions. It's the human aspect that is capable of adapting. So it is ourselves as leaders and how we influence our employees as well that have the capability of adapting. And it is when we are fully adaptive as leaders that we then can create the systems, the processes, and so forth that makes an organization fully adaptive. And so not only can we make everything within the organization adaptive, we can also come up with innovations because that's where the gaps are. You know, if, if our system process or product or service is not fully adaptive, then guess what? The gap of that is innovation. And so, that's how I want to look at this lens. Okay, so what does it mean? And we've kind of already gone through as leaders on the right, on the left, what being adaptable looks like when we're aligned, trust, flexible, patient, open, accepting is our being state, thinking positively, using our imagination, open to explore possibilities, looking for patterns, doing focused, experimenting, exploring options, productive, doing the next right thing. And then our feelings become hopeful, optimistic, empowered, eager, and enthusiastic. Now, what does that look like as an organization? Because this is the challenge to today. Organizations are um, finding that they are not adaptable and that this ability to not adapt is crushing in a lot of instances their success as an organization. And um, that affects not only them, but their shareholders as well as their employees. So what does these states look like when you put the collective together of an organization? So the being becomes the organization's vision and values. You know, if you look at being on the leader side, it's I am trusting, I am flexible, I am patient, I am kind. Well, on the being for the organization is I am here to execute X vision in the, in the world. I, our organization lives by these values. So it is, that is the being for the organization, the vision and the values of what they want to stand for. The thinking becomes communicating inside the organization because we have no way of knowing a leader's thoughts or the leader, the collective leader's thoughts without communication. And so thinking translates into communication. It's how do we make our thoughts known? We put them in writing or we write them down or communicate them. So for the thinking part of the organization as an organism, it's the strategy, the messaging, the communications, incentives, priorities, decisions, policies, and procedures. Uh, those are the things that occupy the thinking space for an organization. And then the doing is the initiatives, the workflows, the job tasks, uh, the systems involved, all the things that allow us to do what we need to do in the world to bring that vision and values to the forefront. The feelings end up being for an organization, the culture, the psychological safetyness of it and the inclusivity of it. So my question is, looking at the organization and what an aligned organization looks like, what are some examples of misalignment that you've experienced in your either in your organizations now or perhaps in some that you've worked for before? Um, because not any organization is perfect. But what can you think of some examples of where perhaps what we were doing didn't align with our values, or perhaps what we were doing didn't align with the communications we've been given? 
Anyone have examples of that? Well, I'll just throw one out here. Um, one organization I was working with was in the trucking industry and their frontline managers were also the sales, main sales force for the team. So they, they sold as well as managed, um, which is a tremendous responsibility on one person or even two if they had a salesperson with them. But they began requiring their salespeople to also be responsible for um, inventory in the fact that certain inventories had to be pulled out unrelated to what the organization was selling, but they had to be pulled out. And so now they were in the warehouse pulling inventory all day and matching it up to the records that the home office now decided that they need to put in a centralized inventory situation. And so not only were they salesperson, but they were also manager, but now they were inventory clerk for, you know, four or five hours, um, several times a week. And so that was an issue for this organization because sales were beginning to decline and the effectiveness of the managers and leading their service teams was basically ineffective because now they were also the inventory clerk as well. And uh, another piece of that involved uh, the paperwork aspect of it. So they were the admin and the inventory clerk. And so they were wearing too many hats. And that was a misalignment because, you know, based on the policies and procedures and based on uh, the strategy and what's been communicated to them as to what their job was there was a disconnect or a misalignment with what they were told they needed to be doing and what they actually had to do based on, um, on the circumstances. So anyone else, now that you've seen one example, anyone else have an example of that in your organization or in an organization you've worked for? Okay. All right. Well, that just gives you an idea. If there is a misalignment, then something is out of whack. And that's what causes the frustration for employees. When, um, when vision and thinking and doing do not align, then that leads to a culture that is frustrated, one that is, you know, doesn't feel safe bringing up their objections or their needs one that feels excluded from being able to uh, solve problems. Uh, it's just a misalignment. And so as I begin to think about, you know, the leader and their alignment and how they help associates or team members get, stay aligned and in a positive and forward moving fashion, how that affected organization's adaptability, then it, the, the idea of flow came to mind because when you think about it adaptability and flow are very similar in that um that adapt flow is when us as individuals are very adaptable right we're flowing with what's going on the task at hand there's really no disruption we're we're in the flow where adaptability is very similar in that you know, whatever is happening, we're going with it. We're, we are adapting and flowing within the organization. And so that brings us to the next slide, which I found interesting. Um, the, yes, the flow state. And this uh, gentleman, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce his name, but he wrote the book Flow. And he was uh, a researcher in the flow state. And this was a quote by him. It said, the best moments in our lives are not the passive, receptive, relaxing times. The best moments usually occur if a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult or worthwhile. And so when I saw that quote um, by this author of The Flow State, it really reminded me of how this is a perfect description of what our organizations are going through today. However, 
it's not a it's not a good thing, right? You know, he's described this situation as something that thrills us, something that puts us in a flow state, which is also known as a happy state. Yet those same conditions are happening in our organizations today, but people don't feel flow and they don't feel happy. And, and the difference of that, or the reason for that disconnect is the alignment that we've been talking about or the misalignment that we've been talking about. So what does it mean to get in a flow state? And, and you know how can we do that both as leaders helping our, our employees and ourselves to get in the flow state and as organizations. The next slide shows you what the flow state is. Flow equals being plus doing. And in another book, uh, I shared a quote on the LinkedIn event page yesterday from Stephen Kotler. He wrote a book about the rise of the superhuman and he went and he did studies of all these X game athletes and uh, crazy extreme sports athletes and how they were a, 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 a accomplished these amazing feats of you know riding hundred foot waves or jumping off hundred foot cliffs, um, all these things that could have put th them to death, um, but didn't. And and how did they get into the flow? And in Stephen Kotler's book, he describes it as awareness and action, but awareness and being are, are, are the same. I just adjusted the um, titles to what we, to the terms we were using today. So flow is really the being and doing. Uh, the, the thinking mind, or at least the logical brain mind is, is really out of the equation. When we are being and doing, we are mindful of the task at hand and we really aren't thinking about anything. Um, we, we are just thinking about what it is we're doing. Uh, there's no uh, ex, extracurricular thinking, which I call problematic thinking, but flow is being and doing. And so to, to become more adaptable as individuals and as organizations, we really have to practice this mindfulness more frequently. Now, it doesn't mean we stop thinking. Obviously, we can't do that. But there are times when thinking is useful and times when thinking is problematic. And that it's the problematic thinking that um, interrupts our flow. It interrupts our ability to be adaptive. And it puts us in those energy states that close us down, leave us stuck, keep us from being expansive, moving and adaptable. And let's talk about those problematic thinking phases next on the next slide, Candace. The next slide is on problematic thinking. Yes, here we go. So problematic thinking and communicating, remember, is the organizational equivalent of thinking it is how our thoughts come into form. So on the individual side or the leader side, the problematic thinking comes in two forms. Internal distractions, which are anxiety, fear, and resistance. And external distractions, which it can include technology, not just, I'm not talking, I'm talking about more than just your notifications popping up. I'm talking about systems not working, uh, systems not being smooth and, um, you know, user friendly, but then also people interruptions and lack of boundaries or, or lack of being able to contain the time that you need to work. How that plays out at an organizational level, uh, obviously we, we can't we often don't recognize as individuals the anxiety and fear. We just know we're running like a crazy person and sometimes we haven't left our chair. Uh, it's that exhausted feeling. That, that is an underlying anxiety and fear. It's the, instead of being in the flow, being present with the action that we're doing, being and doing, we are stuck in our heads. Uh, either ruminating over the past and trying not to make those mistakes again that we may have made or, or missed opportunities or fear of the future, trying to figure out how to get there 
when the path to get to the future is through the present. And so that fear and anxiety takes on different um, levels at an organization. And that comes out in the need to control because when we are in a fear state, uh, our, we want to control everything we can control, including things that are out of our control, which is what lends its hand to anxiety and fear. That need to control comes out in it in different ways in an organization uh, from meetings you know we can't control what's going on with covid or regulations or any of the outside of our control issues but we can control you know when we meet and how we meet and what we talk about so we will control the meetings and we'll control lots of them um other needs to control come out in prioritizing the wrong change initiatives you know uh, as leaders of organizations, oftentimes, because we haven't gone through the design thinking phase, we um, prioritize the wrong change as well. And another issue, and I've seen this a lot with my clients, is that's more policies and procedures and a lot of bloviating. We talk and talk and talk about, you know, having an inclusive culture or psychologically safe culture or you know, of being innovative, but it's all talk and there's no, no um, action, no being or doing that backs it up. And so that brings us to our opportunity to have a design thinking role play, which is our next slide. But before we get to that, I want to open this up for questions and answers um, about the material that we've gone through so far. anyone have any questions so far? Oh. Andrea, did you have a question or a comment on what you've learned so far? Oh, oh, oh. Okay. All right, so let's go to the role play. And this is where I just want to take the time to walk you through briefly. And I realize we're coming to the top of the hour, but I want to just take a few minutes to walk through the empathy phase and the define the problem phase with one of you, one of you as my um, pretend employee or team member. And we're going to talk around the um this issue of adaptability so is there anyone willing to volunteer anyone that's willing to volunteer for me andrea melinda you guys have been vocal okay <laughs> i just wrote you because i was being unable to unmute my my, my microphone i okay. think that uh, yeah i have a uh, bad signal so. okay all right so what all right, are you going to volunteer for me, Andrea? Uh, in which way? Uh, to, to play the role of an employee in an organization. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be, because I, I obviously don't know your job or the job you're going to be representing here. So I'm going to come in as a new manager. And so as a new manager, it's, it, you know, I have a little leeway in that I don't need to understand your job fully to understand some of the bigger issues. So um, what I want you to do is just answer my questions as an employee uh, based on an experience. You can make it up. It can be kind of a combination of experiences at different jobs. It doesn't matter. Um, but I just want you to reply to the questions as an employee talking to a leader about your work circumstance, OK? Okay. And and if if anything becomes unclear, then we, we can time out and get clear and then get back into our conversation. So Andrea, um, thanks so much for coming and talking to me today. You know, as a, a new manager here at XYZ, you know, one of the reasons um, I've been brought in is to to help our organization become more adaptable and uh, you guys as 
my, my team and obviously the organization have gone through a lot in this last year. And uh, some have created big wins for the organization, but then there have been other things where the company has just not been able to adapt as quickly as, as the leaders of the company would like. And so, you know, as my role as new manager, it's important for me to understand really what, how you see adaptability and how you see um, the organization's ability to adapt and, and how that's affected you as a, as a team member here at our organization, ADAPT. So kind of let's start with adaptability. You know, what does it mean to you to be adaptable as an individual and as an organization? Okay, first of all, thanks for uh, uh, coming, approaching me. It's my pleasure meeting you. Okay, um, regarding your question of adaptability, uh, I think that uh, most of the people, most of the team members are very adaptable, like adapting to a new manager, adapting to a new procedure, and uh, or, or to new technologies. However, the problem that I found is that there is a lot of, let's say, digital bureaucracy in the company, which is making all these processes of change uh, slower. Um, I think that the standard op operations procedures are not being updated as they would. So in some areas, we still uh, adapt to new circumstances, but in some other, we are still uh, stuck to the old standards. Okay, so what I hear you saying, Andrea, is bureaucracy and updated policies and or not updated policies and procedures are kind of the stumbling blocks for you as an individual to be more adaptable. No, it's not affecting me personally, but it is affecting the overall project. It's like, okay, I try to adapt myself to the different changes, but I find, I find this boundary, which comes from the company. I mean, okay. we are all willing to be more adaptable, but uh, yeah, I think it's the company that is uh, refraining us from that. And, and just so you know, Andrea, obviously these conversations are confidential and, and I'll be having them with each and every one of our team members because, uh, you know, there are certain things in my role as a leader that I can change. And then there are also things that are out of my scope as our team leader to that I need to escalate. And so it's really important for me to understand not just yours, but as your all of your teammates as well, you know, how, what this bureaucracy and this um, policy and procedure is specifically so that I can take action to remove those obstacles from you and, and your teammates. And so uh, I'm really looking just for your opinions and your thoughts on it. Uh, it's it's going to be really synthesized with the team to come up with the collective issues that can be tackled by myself with the team together, and then also you know escalated to the um, the higher management. So uh, feel free to speak freely uh, because that's going to be allow me to implement the changes and, and allow the team to participate in that change that needs to happen. That's gonna make the work better for yourself as well as for everyone. So um, in the bureaucracy, can you give me an example of maybe um, when that's come up and how that's looked for you? Okay, uh, for instance, when you, you know, uh, need something, need to add a new technology or a new software or make a decision or or uh, do something that is not within the standardized procedures mm -hmm. you have to go through so many approvals that i mean you have done like okay you go to the team leader the team leader goes to the team manager the team manager goes to the 
delivery manager. The delivery manager hopes to quality, I mean, all that, all, mm -hmm. all that uh, workflow should be okay. shortened. So, so what I hear you saying is like for decision making purposes, when you have a decision to make, if it's outside the standard policies and procedures, then it has to go through too many levels of approval to, to, to get the decision made. And so that wastes time on your part. Uh, it sounds very frustrating, I would think. What else is going on when that's happening for your team and yourself? Okay, it delays uh, the final the delivery about in many cases. Okay, and you uh, don't meet the the SLAs, the standard level agreement with the client. So you you won't have a satisfied client because it's everything takes too long. Mm. Okay. Um, and perhaps, obviously we don't have time today in this meeting, but if, if you can get me, uh, give some thought to, while I talk with your other teammates, if there's a specific standard, uh, policy and procedure that keeps coming up more frequent than the others, then maybe we can tackle that first and, um, move on to the others. But I, I certainly hear that, that, uh, policies and procedures and the ability to make decisions on the ground are, are a frustrating piece for you and one that yeah. uh, needs to be removed in order for our team and obviously the organization as a whole to, to begin to be more adaptable. Okay, there are several areas that are affected. Uh, to give you a proper answer of which are the most important ones, uh, I think I should do an analysis, like a root cause analysis or something like that. Yeah. Uh, maybe there we could define or give you a, be a better answer. Okay. Well, that's great, Andrea. So, um, and time out from our conversation, obviously, w this meeting would go longer in the traditional sense. Um, but this is a great place to stop because, Andrea, we are going to... Um, Again, this conversation is going to be an ongoing conversation because these issues that are prohibiting you and your teammates and me as your manager from, you know, being adaptable and, and moving forward as an organization are the things that we are going to spend the next weeks and months uh, working on removing and revamping and revising so that and innovating so that we can become the more adaptable organization we need to be. Um, so I want to thank you for, you know, being willing to share your experience as well as, you know, your feelings about the experience. And once I uh, begin to talk to your other teammates and we have a synthesis of what the major problems are with policies and procedures, then we can begin, we'll define the problem and, and take it from there to begin to creatively solve that problem together. How's that sound? That sounds great. Um, thank you for taking my opinions into, into consideration. And of, of course, yeah. I will be willing to help in any circumstance. Yeah. So um, back to the group now. That is really just an abbreviated version of what empathy in an employee situation um, looks like. And empathy is just phase one of design thinking, where you begin to uncover the needs of the employee. So obviously, you know, as, as a leader and as the organization, we have goals, which include, you know, servicing our clients and meeting deliverable deadlines and all that. But as you can see, the problem of, or the needs of the employee of Andrea are the problems the organization has in, in meeting its vision. And that is, you know, she's unable to make decisions, the, the policies and procedures take too long, or they don't even cover the decision that's being need, in need of being made. So that's just one area where you can apply the innovative principles of design thinking to remove the obstacles, which are also the employee's needs. So you're meeting their needs, you're removing obstacles, and you're getting closer to meeting that vision of taking care of your clients. So that brings us to the end 
of this uh, webinar. We just went a few minutes over, but uh, if you'll take us to the final slide, and uh, Candace, um, we'll wrap up with any questions. We did that one. And any final questions on adaptability and what it looks like when we are being adaptable, when we're flowing more as an individual and as an organization, and then applying uh, just the beginnings of what design thinking looks like, the needs that it can uncover in our employees, as well as how it can help us achieve the vision. Any questions before we wrap up? Well, everyone, I appreciate your time and coming on. I hope you found this uh, seminar useful. Next, if you have suggestions, this is going to be a monthly event. Um, we're going to tackle each month a different aspect of leadership and the challenges you face as leaders and how that can be um, enhanced and um, improved by the use of design thinking skills how it will allow you to innovate things that matter not only to you as a leader, but to your organization as well as to your employees. So thank you so much, everyone. You have a great day. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thanks to all. Bye-bye. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.